In the last couple segments, we've seen how scientists at the end of the 1800s, they were starting to collect all this information about the structure of the atom. The electron was discovered, and then Rutherford's experiments demonstrated that the electrons are on the outside, and there's some kind of a nucleus on the inside, and that there's a lot of empty space in that atom. So we start to develop this model of an electron orbiting around the outside of the nucleus. But there's a real problem with this, because according to electromagnetic theory from the 1800s, according to Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, an accelerating electron should radiate energy. And of course, an object moving in a circle is accelerating. Its velocity is changing. And so it is accelerating. And according to electromagnetic theory, it should radiate energy and it should lose its kinetic energy then. And we expect it to spiral into the nucleus, which makes sense. Um, We've calculated the force between an electron and a proton, and we've seen that that electric force is incredibly strong, right? So there's this attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative electron pulling it in, and we expect the electron to lose some energy and spiral in and collapse. So how is it that we're here 14 billion years after the Big Bang, 14 billion minus a few hundred thousand years since basically all of the hydrogen in the universe was created. How is that hydrogen still around? Why did those electrons not spiral in and combine with the nucleus? Well, that's a puzzle. Uh, Bohr proposed that maybe the electrons exist only in certain allowed orbits. And for some reason or another, they're not allowed to go to other orbits. And these are what we can call stationary states. And so, you know, here might be one stationary state, here might be another stationary state. But the electron can never exist where there's no allowed orbit. Again, in his initial proposal, Bohr didn't really have a reasoning for why this is. He just said, hey, I think this might be how it works. So this sets up an energy level diagram. And you know what? This works pretty well. It, 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 it solves some problems. And so here we see this energy level diagram, much like we saw in the last chapter when we constrained a particle to a box. The lowest energy state we call the ground state. And then much like we did with the particle in the box, we can label our energy states as one, two, and three. And two and three, and so on, there'd be four, five, six. Um, then those energy levels are all excited states. We call the lowest energy level the ground state. So how can an electron transition between states? Well, it can move from an excited state to the ground state by releasing some energy. That energy will be released in the form of a photon. How can it be uh, excited? Well, it can move into an excited state by either absorbing some energy from an approaching photon, or it could possibly get excited from a collision by another electron. And in fact, in a gas discharge tube, such as what we saw when we were looking at those the neon light, uh, then the atoms there are getting excited by collisions with electrons. So we can have a collision between an electron and an atom, which will bump this uh, one of the electrons within the atom to an excited state. But either way, however they get excited, they will transition to a lower state by releasing a Again, this is the photon emission. So this is Bohr's basic model, in that these excited states only exist at certain energies. And so, knowing that, we can calculate the wavelength or the frequency of a photon by, if we know, the change in the energy of the atom. Now notice that this is not really a new equation. It's just that now our quantum system is an atom. It's not this particle in a box. And so again, this is just the, 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 the energy of a photon, and here we just have that written. In and so much like we did with our particle in a box, we can create an energy level diagram for some atom. And uh, here we've labeled the energies here on this, the, this, this, in the vertical direction, the energy increases. And these lines just represent our energy state. So absorption transitions must start at n equals 1. And emission transitions can start anywhere and end anywhere. So this helps us understand this slide we saw earlier, 
where we saw that the absorption spectrum had fewer lines than the emission spectrum. Why is that? Because atoms really don't like to live in their excited state. They tend to exist in the ground state. If they are given some energy through photon absorption or a collision, then they will jump into a higher energy state, but they very quickly transition back to the ground state. So if you show me a tube of, say, helium atoms, then 99.99% of them are in the ground state at any one moment. Therefore, we only see absorption lines starting from the n equals 1 state under most circumstances. We'll go ahead and say all circumstances for the sake of this class. However, for emission, it can start anywhere. So a atom could get excited into the n equals 3 state, and then it might transition to the n equals 2 state, and then release another photon to get to the n equals 1 state. So this helps us understand why the absorption spectrum has so many fewer lines than the emission spectrum does. Let's do a quick example. This will be very similar to an example that we might have done uh, in the last chapter with a particle in a box. But let's say that we have an electron and it collides with an atom. Okay? So we've got a, a two electron volt electron, and it collides with this atom that has the energy level diagram shown here. Questions are, what is the electron's <laughs> kinetic energy after the collision? And when the atom returns to its ground state, what wavelength of photon will be emitted? Okay, so for this first one, we just need to figure out what is the electron's kinetic energy after the collision? So here we're talking about the electron that collides with the atom, and then presumably it keeps moving. Well, we want to use conservation of energy. So we'll say that the energy initially of the electron, well, where did that go? Right? Conservation of energy says the total initial energy must equal the total energy finally. And so, well, it changed the energy of the atom. And it also has some energy final. Okay, so here I've just applied conservation of energy. Total initial energy must equal total final energy. Well, recall that this was two electron volts. Let's look at our energy level diagram. Is two electron volts enough to get us into the n equals 3 state? It's not. We would need four electron volts to get to the n equals 3 state. Can it get us to the n equals 2 state? It totally can. It can get this atom into the n equals 2 state. Well, that means the delta E of the atom is the difference between the n equals 1 state and the n equals 2 state. In other words, there's no way for delta E of the atom to be two electron volts because there is not an energy level at two electron volts. And so the change in the energy of the atom must be 1.5 electron volts because that's the only energy level that this atom can get to if it's given two electron volts. Well, that means that we can solve for the final energy of so energy final of the electron equals 0 0.5 electron volts. So that means now our atom is in the n equals 2 state. When it returns to the ground state, what wavelength of photon will be emitted? Well, in this case, we just want to use this equation here, lambda photon. And in this case, uh, the delta E of the atom now will be 1.5 electron volts, because that's how much energy is released when this atom goes from the n equals 2 state to the n equals 1 state. And so I'll go ahead and plug in my H in electron volt seconds, and we can just do this calculation. And we run our calculator, and we get... 828 nanometers, 
So that's just outside the visible range.